welcome back to the Rugby Pod. I'm Andy Ryan, Big Jim and Goody are with me as usual. We'll be looking back at all the Premiership action, as well as speaking to London Irish's Ollie Hassel Collins. Plus, we'll be looking ahead to the return of the Champions Cup this weekend. So settle back, enjoy, and make sure you've subscribed on Spotify. Pod, 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 pod. Rugby Pod. How's your week been, lads? Well, yeah, apart the first day, I'm just more bothered about the award. Sports Podcast Awards. I was out celebrating over the weekend. We are the greatest rugby podcast on this planet. So uh, a massive thank you to <laughs> everyone. We said it in our thank you speech. A massive thank you to everyone who voted for us. Um, the only slight tinge of regret that I've got about winning that award, or two really. Uh, one, it would have been nice had this mad COVID world not sort of taken over over the last few months. And we'd had a real live award ceremony that we could have rocked up like absolute heroes and had a massive night out again. Uh, that would have been great. But secondly, as it was online, uh, and as we know, there were two presenters presenting the awards. James Haskell was one of them and he refused to give us the award, didn't he? Because his podcast is absolute garbage. Uh, so Haskell um, crying in, in his spilt milk. Um, but yeah, we are the greatest rugby podcast in the world. So um, humble. thank you. Yeah, very humble about it as well. Thank you, ladies. No, generally are humbled. You got to celebrate your own success, haven't you? But you know the the award ceremony was last Thursday evening. Uh, we've had to keep very tight lips over this over the last few weeks uh, since the voting closed, and we knew we'd won the award. And um, yeah, some joyous memories brought back to me. See the video that we did in Belfast, and seeing Jim's shocking fucking shirt that he had on. Why were we not invited anywhere? Why were we not allowed to go and accept the award humbly? Is it because did, I'm surely Hass wouldn't have let us not do that? Surely not. Surely not the world's most popular podcast versus the world's number one podcast. Surely there's not that beef, is there? No, there was no there was no award ceremony, but basically Haskell said, and I spoke to the guy from Sports Podcast Awards, sent me a message and said Haskell was absolutely raging that he didn't win it. Um, he's got about 14 podcasts, none of them won anything. Um, and he refused to announce us as the winners as well. So um, the lady had to do it. But such is life, eh? Oh, thank you, is what I want to say. Thank you. I don't know what we get. I don't know where we get to go. But Andy Rowe will be peacocking on LinkedIn for another year. <laughs> um, that'll be part of it. How funny is LinkedIn? How funny is LinkedIn? The fact that like you could be a bid man and you could put yourself as an environmental scientist on there. On LinkedIn, it's a bloody great platform. But nonetheless, yeah, Andy Rowe, it's another kind of award that you can add to your list of awards. Two-time award, award winner now, two times. <laughs> Jim, you got an award, well, not an award, a certificate, didn't you, over the weekend? Yeah, I did, yeah, thank you. It was actually on Friday. I got my motorcycle licence from Harley-Davidson Edinburgh. got a sticker, it's on the back wall for the people watching, people listening. Also, wait there, hang on. Please tell me it's the helmet. Oh no! What's I, that? I got I got a rucksack. I got a rucksack as well. So I got a rucksack and a pen and my boots and my motorcycle. So yeah, I passed. I passed, lads. Is what I'm saying. Got my motorbike license. It's going to look unbelievable on Instagram. That is all I'm thinking the whole way through. <laughs> Andrew, get you in the sidecar or not? Uh, no, mate. You're having a midlife crisis. Anyone that wants to take a motorcycle test and drive a Harley or ride a Harley shall we say at nearly 40 years of age Jim I don't like motorbikes Jim they're dangerous and as a father of four I know you want your time away from the kids and you want to put some pictures up on Instagram but that ain't me I'm happy in my range mate uh, if you get in a crash you, you're probably going to win most of the collisions so um, yeah Andrew you're bringing it down now you're making me feel bad now you sound like that <laughs> I'm just thinking Instagram, just it was either that it was either that or it was golf and as you know golf is a sport for white bolding arrogant males and that doesn't fit me that doesn't fit the mold that I'm in you so bold, you're bolding you are bolding no, prove it prove it I'll bend over a bit I can't I mean next sort <laughs> are you going to join a motorbike gang well I might set one up I don't need to join one I'm going to set up the Hamilton, Harley, Edinburgh crew, if that's the name. Just sounds cool and edgy as fuck, does it not? When I said just that. But... It, yeah, just call it the melted wheelie bins. That'd be, that'd be about right. <laughs> well, it doesn't sound cool, does it? Yeah, it does. Really cool. No, it does. does it? All right, I will then. Easily convinced <laughs> and manipulated. But yeah, so big shout out to Edinburgh Harley. They put me through the course. And uh, hey, I'm going to the shop tomorrow to have a look at what bikes I can fit on, what bikes I'm going to get. And... It's either that or golf, and I've chosen the bikes for now. We'll see. But Andrew said it's a midlife crisis. 
I'm not even 40. I ain't through. Arguably, you could say I am halfway through my life or even further past that. But, Andrew, goodness me, 50. You were 50, weren't you, at the weekend? <laughs> no, I wasn't, James. No, I wasn't. You know, for what I was. I was 42 in honest years, uh, which is about 26 in Fijian years. Uh, or if you take out the two COVID years, it was my 40th. Let's just say it was my 40th on Saturday. So, um, yeah, it was. I, we won an award on Thursday. It was my birthday on that Sunday, actually. Uh, so we went out for dinner on Saturday night. Um, and then Sunday, I, I wanted to sit home and watch my good friend Jim Hamilton commentate on London Irish against Harlequins and see him on TV. Uh, but you but went to the, the farm. Miss- Animals. I went to the zoo. No, the oh, missus. <laughs> yeah. She was like, we've got to take the kids out. What do you want to do? And I went, well, let's, I don't know. Let's go to the zoo. So we went up to the zoo, which was good fun. Um, you love animals, so, don't you? You like you are an animal man. You eat a lot of animals. You eat a lot of them, like especially true, fried yeah. animals. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you do anything else with animals or not? Or is it just look at them? Uh, I do a lot of work with the Dogs Trust, uh, which there is a go. fantastic organisation. Yeah. Doggy um, style. What's that called? Doggy what? Doggy style? Doggy Trust. Yeah, dogs trust. Yeah, yeah. I try doggy oh, style. Dogs trust. How's that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> lights off. It's fine. There you go. It's my birthday. Saturday night, went out for dinner. Sunday, we went to the zoo, and I wanted to sit home and watch Jim Hamilton on BT Sport. And apparently, Jim, you were waxing lyrical about your new favourite team, the Harlequins. Oh, such a pleasure to commentate on and watch. Who the fuck are you, Jim? Like that, you have I turned. Am, I am second voice for BT Sport commentating on the big one, the big game on Sunday. So it's just backing up the interactions on social media, as you know, Andrew. Um, where do I start? Let's start with that game at the weekend that I was involved in. It was tough, is what I want to say, Andrew. I know you've done a few of them recently. A lot going on. And I looked back at the game. I know Andy Rowe will get us into the rugby a little bit later on, but... It was a tough gig because so much was happening. So I went back and watched the game. I missed loads. It wasn't like the hashtag always Edinburgh versus the Lions off tube in the studio in Dublin where there weren't much happening. There was so much happening that my head was scrambled. I'm trying to ad lib. I'm trying to hit the names. I'm trying to hit the detail. And I missed a few bits. A bit scrappy, be honest. A bit out of touch with things. What did you miss? I didn't miss anything major. I missed some detail stuff around what could have been and what should have been. I missed talking up Tizard a couple of times and some of the stuff that he did. Uh, but anyway, Austin picked that up in the studio with Benny Kay because they're the go-outs, aren't they? So uh, it was good. It took me out of my comfort zone. That Brentford Stadium is phenomenal. I know Goody mentioned it on the podcast a couple of weeks. Andy Rowe, you went for 10 minutes and then the <laughs> missus called you home because you're a podcaster and she needs to get you home. I don't know why she wanted to get you home, but she did. But it was, He's married uh, now, so he's not allowed out. I snuck out, but she found out. Yeah, reports were, Jim, that you were outstanding. You used some big words. Um, what big word? I don't know. Someone messaged me on, on Instagram. <laughs> You're just trying to be nice. You're just trying no, to be no. nice, Andrew, aren't you? Uh, no, no, no. Like people were saying, generally, I had some really good comments about you. I'm like, this is fucking weird. Why is my uh, all my DMs being filled up with people telling me how great Jim is? I'm like, how about, how about me? I didn't think that. I was very proud of you, James. Um, it was great. To, and I did have a little flick on. Uh, last night when I put the kids to bed and um, you sounded so good Jim you should do that more often are you drunk still from what are you saying all this for <laughs> imagine doing a game together how good would that be well we'll talk more about the premiership in a minute but the champions cup round of 16 is back this weekend and we don't see two legged ties in rugby very often are you guys are you guys fans of them I used to love that back to back thing but then actually now making it knock out back to back games and uh, obviously, the points differential there. And I played in one of these. I played in the final, the big one, actually, a few years back. The uh, the championship final, Worcester Warriors against Cornish Pirates. Everyone remembers it. Didn't see it. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it was a two-legged final. So um, we played away first leg and then home second leg. I think I got man the match in both games, but, you know, it doesn't really matter what happened. But um, I actually really enjoyed that nervousness around you, you play week one, you know, and then how many points you've got to try and win by if you're at home or whatever. And it's, yeah, I played in one for Wasps as well uh, against that front, so a knockout game, two-legged knockout home and away uh, to qualify for the Champions Cup at the end of my first year at Wasps. And I remember we beat them at home by two points. I think it was. I got a penalty the last play of the game, a really simple penalty. So um, to, to put us two points up and everyone's like, you're going to have to stop on, so you've got absolutely no chance. They'll do you by about 15 
in their own patch. And then we went over there and won as well. So I love it. But, you know, it's really exciting. A couple of weeks coming up, some massive games. And I was actually piecing together and trying to look forward to the quarterfinals as well. And, you know, who's going to end up playing who. I, I, I love the, the fact that, you know, we've, we haven't seen really any dead rubber games in, in the group stages. And now we're at this stage where it's knockout last 16 and there's a lot of big teams left in. So it's going to be absolutely cracking a couple of weekends, I think. How do you remember all these games that you played in? All I remember is the ones that I carved up in, which was... India. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I genuinely, genuinely don't remember any other games. How do you remember all them games, Andrew? Have you, like, before the podcast, have you gone back through the archive just to remember that or the tip of your tongue? I mean, or you could be making them up and I'm nodding like I believe you, either way. <laughs> no, no, do your research. No, it's just one of those things because it is the first real time in top tier competition, you know, that we've seen these back-to-back knockout games. Um, I, I love it. I really do. And so it made me think back to what I've done in my career. And um, yeah, the big one was Worcester against the Cornish Pirates. A huge, huge one. I remember we won down there and a few of us like, let's just go to the local pub and have a beer with some of the fans, some of the home and away fans. And we'd, we'd beaten Cornish Pirates by about 10 points. Um and Richard Hill was like, no, there is going to be no drinking until we have won at the championship next week. Oh, like, oh all right, Gregor. Oh, all right, Gregor. All right, Gregor. <laughs> um, so anyway, a few of us went to this, this pub anyway and had a couple of pints with some of the fans and we got bollocking. I was like, all right, mate, drop me. Um, so, yeah, but listen, it's I, I'm looking forward to it. So you can effectively lose your first game and, and then go and hose a team at home the week after. So it's there's going to be some crackers out there and um, yeah, some massive fixes as well when you look at the teams. Any games in particular we want to highlight that you guys are looking forward to the most? Yeah, to lose Ulster. They're all big, like Goody said. There's a Paris derby, Stade Francais, Racing, Exeter, Munster, lot. At this point, I could read them all off, but they're all big. But to lose Ulster, I like the look of Ulster this year. The URC, they're going well. They've had a couple of tough games in South Africa. And I say that because they've lost them two games. But I think that'll put them in a better position having played two tough South African teams away to then go to France away. They'll be battle hardened, is what I'm saying. They've got a bit of strength in Jet Lagster as well. Jet lagged. Oh, Andrew, you're, you're right. Actually, now you think making you think that they can't do it <laughs> in Toulouse. Uh, but Toulouse, everything's about DuPont, isn't it, at the minute? And I can't wait to watch him play again in Europe, absolutely carving up whether or not he's on the bench, whether or not he comes on. But I like the look of Ulster at the minute. I really do. I didn't think they'd do much in Europe this year. And off the back of them Saturday games, we could talk about some of the other ones if we want. But I'm looking oh, some, forward yeah. to say if they can Gwyneth. do something. Yeah. And Sunday for me, Jim was mentioned Saturday, Montpellier against Quinns, top of the top 14 against Harlequins, who are our champions. I say our champions, Jim Hamilton. They are. They are. They're, they're, they're our champions. <laughs> yeah. Jim Hamilton's favourite team now. Uh, it's such a pleasure to watch and commentate on them <laughs> on his Twitter feed. Uh, you absolute, turn, you absolute turn coat, Jim. Absolute turn coat. You've gone from goat I hate sees him. Goat. The, <laughs> goat sees goat. You've gone from what's their culture? Don't, you know, they're just all blowbags. They all, you know, they grow a set when they play Saracens. To now, oh, such a pleasure to commentate on them and watch them play, which is true. Did I say that? Uh, is that what I said? That's what you put on Twitter, mate. Not just what you yeah, said. Yeah, I, I wouldn't put it like that. I was like, it's so good, so good to commentate, so good to do this. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> love it. Why are you See, speaking like you're from Watford now? Well, I don't know. Hey, don't stereotype, mate. I'm actually from Coventry, which is where the roots are, just north of the Hebrides. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to delete the tweet now, but I had a lot of interaction, so... <laughs> don't delete it. <laughs> be yourself, Jim. Just be yourself. Be that... Person that you're trying to pretend to be as well. Um, uh, Claremont Leicester as well be a big one. Uh, loads again. Like it's it's a fabulous competition. Listen, Leinster, the form that Leinster in are over the, the past couple of weeks, they've gone down to Munster and absolutely dispatched them uh, in the URC. They beat Connacht by fifty odd the week before, and they're going back to Connacht this weekend. So it's really interesting. Like you look at some of the games this weekend. So in France, uh, Bordeaux played La Rochelle, and uh, Christophe Urios, the Bordeaux head coach, slapped. Or tried to slap Ron Nagara. Let's say he slapped him. He wanted Head to eat him. him. I'm just going to say, he dropped the head, wanted to eat him, got his knife and fork out and was ready just to dish him up. Um, they're playing, they're going to end up playing each other three weeks on the bounce. So they played the weekend just gone in the top 14, then obviously the next two weeks. Same for Paris, the, the, the Paris teams. 
Uh, Racing 92 absolutely dominated Stade Francais last night uh, in the top 14 Paris derby at... Uh, but they're miles better, aren't they? Racing yeah. are miles better than Stade. Yeah, but then Stade have got La Mappe, so he's hard as fuck. Um, so, yeah, listen, you know, it's and they're playing each other three weeks on the trot now as well. So kind of weird the way things like that happen. Um, but, yeah, some massive teams. And then Leicester are top of the Premiership at the minute. They want to translate that form into Europe, as they have done so far uh, this season. Um, you know, they're playing Claremont, who are not performing that well, but they're normally a big European team. And then if they can get past Claremont in the next two weeks, they'll probably end up playing Leinster in the quarterfinals. So, <laughs> like, some big old games. Leinster looking tasty as anything at the minute. And, um, yeah, it should be a massive couple of weekends. I told a lie, actually. I said that I was looking forward to, to lose Ulster on Saturday. I've just rejigged and had a look at the fixtures again. And it's the one in the evening that I'm really, really looking forward to. Newcastle Zebra. Can't wait. <laughs> in the challenge. I thought you were going to say the uh, the extra Munster game because I'm on comms, Jim. So you'll be able to listen to me and I'll be able to say, oh, it's such a pleasure to be commentating on Exeter Chips. And I will say that you sounded so good and it sounded like you'd eaten 15 hot dogs or burgers or saveloys before, and I will. <laughs> Looking forward to going to Exeter, actually. There's a bloke, you, you'll be surprised by this, there's a bloke uh, that works there, the security... Who thought you were a legend? Well, no, he always delivers me a Cornish pasty whenever I go down there, so um, well, just for that, no, really, I'm looking forward to that. But no, that is, it's like, is he a feeder then? Is he? What's he thinking? I think What's he's he a feeder, yeah. When I, when I used to play there for Worcester or Wasp, he's always come into the changing rooms and give me a Cornish pasty. And then every time I've been down there to commentate, he sees me and he walks over with one. So hopefully I'll get two for this weekend, one before the game, one to take home with me in the car. He should be sacked because that's <laughs> negligence of a human being, in my opinion. So, <laughs> What's his name? What's his name, Goody? I can't tell you. I can't Dave. tell you. Don't security know. man Bob, Dave. security man, yeah, security <laughs> man Dave. There you go. All right, Dave. Jim Goody rattled off a few of his favourite memories just before. Have you have you got any from uh, from your days in in the knockout stages of the Heineken Cup? Two minutes here, two minutes there, right? Yeah, there's a few, there's a few. Been involved <laughs> in a few biggies. Can't really dig too far into the archives, but I'm gonna. Um, great competition. Goody mentioned it there. He also mentioned the Worcester Cornish Pirates, which isn't a great competition, but it is if you're playing in them. But the European Cup, absolutely love it. And, you know, for me, I've accumulated a load of caps. I think I've got 49, but uh, let's just round it up to 50 and say i got a cap. So a load of ones, but they're big ones. Um, yeah, like, where do you want to go? Do you want to talk finals, semis, quarters? Where do you want? What do you want? Why don't we talk about your post-rugby career and the way you foresaw what you were going to go into and you put yourself in the centre of that photo for Saracens to try and make sure that you were stayed current for the fun for the next year. Was that was that planned? You're right it was, mate. What John Terry. John Terry right there. Of genius. That's what it was. I knew I was retiring. I thought, you know what? And there's a funny answer and there's a serious answer because I'm a humble man. And in years gone by, I've just been at the back of pictures, just, no, I don't want to be in. I don't, I don't, it's not about me. You know what I mean? It's not about me. But this one, I thought, fuck you all. I was like, I am going out on a high year. I have been to the well all this season for Saracens. I played in nearly every game. Let's just round up. I played in every minute of the game until we got to the quarterfinals, until we got to the really important games. <laughs> and I didn't play. And I got to the final. And I remember being stood on the sideline against Racing in Edinburgh, and I was like, I'm going to be absolutely deboed if I don't get on. And I've stood there. Luckily, there was a knock-on or something, and I looked at those 42 seconds to go. And the difference of being on the bench to being on the pitch, well, you saw the celebrations like I just won the World Cup. We hadn't. We just won Europe. But the celebrations were remarkably different. I remember going up, and I thought, this is it. This is my final moment to be front and centre. So behind me is Brad Barrett, the captain even though he's lifting the trophy up. Marrow and Owen, you can't even see them. And me and Petrus Dupacy, <laughs> who's on par with me in terms of stealing a living, we are literally jumping up and down in front of the picture. And that, that went viral, didn't it? Because that was the showcase. That was the, the intro to all the games of the European Cup for the year after. So that was my final moment as a rugby player. What you saw that picture was me, the guard down, 
the man that felt he deserved that moment. And that was it. I never, I have never stepped on a rugby field again. That was it. Ironically, in Edinburgh, on me back, absolutely bollocks having played 40 seconds. And that was it. That was the, that was the final hurrah. Well, a question on that, Jim. Tell us about the night out then, because from what I hear, it was the post-match celebrations that made you retire from playing the game because you went that hard that you got an illness that then made you not being able to play rugby ever again. You want to speak to Billy Vanapola. We'll get him on at some point and talk about this because he used to call me the Beyonce of Edinburgh. In fact, I might have called it myself, the Beyonce of Edinburgh. <laughs> <laughs> when you go out and get absolutely mobbed, so you had to hide. So you can imagine the night out. We're in the jam house. Everything was paid for. I don't know if you can say that because of Saracens. But I mean, we all put into a kitty and it was all free off the back of that. <laughs> Uh, we're at the Jam House. Me and Kelly Brown are on stage. Genuinely, I feel like I'm a red hot chilli pepper. I am flying. Poor Bex out, heavily pregnant with the twins. Massive bump, belly bu- button popping out everywhere because she's close. And I'm um, living the dream. Rock star Beyonce's in town. Get back to the hotel, three, four in the morning. And it was big, but it wasn't like Belfast big. It was big, but not Belfast big. And I couldn't get out of bed the next day. Thought I had food poisoning, thought I had alcohol poisoning. And that was the start of the illness and the retirement came off the back of that. And I remember getting the train back the next day because we had extra on the semi-final the Saturday after. And I couldn't even, I'm on the train, I'm lying by the toilet. I mean, you talk about rock and roll, I'm lying on my back by the toilet. Billy keeps walking past just saying, Beyonce, what's wrong with you? I'm like, I've been food poisoned. (laughs) Someone's poisoned me food. Something's happened. And my last memory of that weekend and everyone's memory, because they've all got videos and pictures of it, is me in the back of me Mondeo. Kelly's missus is driving me to stay at their house because I'm that ill and my head's hanging out the window and everyone's shouting, Beyonce's going home. (laughs) (laughs) So what you're saying is you went a little bit too hard and embarrassed yourself, right? Because you can't handle your your, your piss. Beck, absolutely raging. Absolutely (laughs) raging. But I went out on my sword and I went out with a story and I went out on stage. The Red Hot Chili Pipers, as they called me. Let's have a look at the Premiership now. Then Sale v Saracens. That was a bruising encounter, wasn't it, to kick off the weekend? Should we talk about Al Sanderson's hair first or not? He's just, he's succumbed. He's just like, that's it. It's similar yeah. to me. He's got, a, he's got a similar hairline to me. Like that's like, when I look at it, it's like a little bit thin, it's like a little bit at the back, but nothing too bad. And he's just gone, forget it. It's going. He looks hard as nails. That's what all <laughs> I picked up from that game. Yeah, I'll tell you, Jim, you've got a lot more hair than he had because uh, it's been going thinner and thinner. Another compliment for you, Jim, yours isn't anywhere near as bad as what his was. And then fair play to him, he's just picked it and now he looks like a cage fighter or something. If he tells you you're playing shit, you like, you, you're like, yes, boss, you'd absolutely <laughs> shit yourself because he did look mean. But yeah, the game uh, itself, it was always going to be a bit of a war, wasn't it? You know, the way Saracens bring their physicality, you know, you look at Sale, the South Africans they've got in their team. They don't hang around, do they? They go looking for contact like you wouldn't believe. Um, and there were some big moments in the game, weren't there? There was obviously um, the decision around, should it have been a yellow card or a red card uh, for Davis on Fafter Clerk? Um, you know, but Saracens were good. Like, they played this brand of rugby, 41 kicks um, from hand for Saracens in the game. So basically, it's a kick every two minutes. Now, if you ma- imagine the ball's only in play for 40 minutes a game, and that's really high, I think. Uh, so it's probably like ball and play times are probably normally around anywhere between 35 and 40 minutes. They're kicking it every minute that's on the clock in, in the game. So, but that's how they play. And they, you know, they knew that Saracens against Sale, Sale coached by an ex Saracen in Alex Anderson, probably knows the ins and outs of uh, how to try and put pressure on Saracens better than anyone else would do. And Sale kicked the leather off it as well, trying to negate what Saracens do and it was abrasive it was tough it was you know everything that you'd expect a, a sale Saracens game to be about and um, you know sale didn't really take the opportunities they had they had a few opportunities but coughed up the ball a few times in Saracens 22 but you've got to credit Saracens for their defence and you know that really kind of nailed their home semi-final I think for me um, in, with that victory and you know they've, they've gone they've come back from the Six Nations got some players involved they had a massive game last week at Tottenham then obviously sailed away and then I think they're, they're back in they've got a big one this weekend though Saracens massive game 
or either way. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, yeah, I'm probably not going to watch it, but yeah, it's good to point it out. And a couple of headlines from that, Beno, outstanding. Yeah. Not back that to he back had a the matches, in, There you go. But not that he had a dip in form, but he did so well when he was at Bristol so he was a standout performer. It's taken a while for him to come back into the Saracens team and shine how he did at the weekend. And Mark McCall mentioned it after the game, didn't he, in terms of, well, after the game against Bristol at the Tottenham Stadium, they didn't play that well. He mentioned it again after the game uh, sale at the weekend. They didn't play that well against Bristol. But the thing is, you've got the Saracens. They're a big team, aren't they? They're a big team that when the pressure's on or when they need to either back up a performance or come off the back of a poor performance, there's no better place to go and do it up in sale where physically that's going to be a more comfortable game for them, I imagine, with no disrespect to sale because that's the Saracens' DNA, is the wolf pack, is the defence, is the kicking game, all them things. So Sale has always been an easier game for Saracens because of the way that they play, where they've struggled before Saracens, the teams like London Irish who throw the ball around, Harlequins, my team who throw the ball around, uh, Bristol's, again, a, a similar thing as well. So I think Saracens, we're now seeing a team, like we are with a few of the other teams in the Prem, business end of the season, the quality shine through. So that's a big win, like Goody said, up in Manchester. Hell of a win for Wasps as well, Goody. Yeah, huge. Um, didn't see it coming, to be honest. Because Gloucester have been so good at home. Um, Wasps have been patchy, you know, really inconsistent. When they're good, they're really good. When they're bad, they're, you're looking at them going, geez, you know, you, you wouldn't expect the under-15s to play that badly sometimes. But And they can do that in games, both be sublime and ridiculous um the interesting thing a few eyebrows were raised on the selection of the wasp team dan robson was dropped to the bench um obviously an ex-gloucester player as well but um will porter uh, who's been coming on at nine for dan robson has been playing really well he started and got picked ahead of dan robson um and then dobby as he's known dan robson comes off the bench uh, slots a wonderful drop goal we saw george ford do it earlier in the season didn't we from that goal line dropout Catch it, bang. Do you know when Dobby hit that drop goal, Goody? Do you think yeah. because he would have been pissed off, do you think he's gone, fuck yeah, has he's kicked it through or not? Do you think no, he's there's actually, no part of that? No, I don't I don't think there is. Like he, he he's a uh, you know Dobby, uh, Dan Robson uh, as well as other people. He's a lovely guy, isn't he? Like really nice guy. And he was pretty honest and went, I haven't been playing that well. Um, I think the England thing may have affected him a little bit. Um, you know, he had an injury earlier in the season, but Will Porter has come on and done exceptionally well for Wasps. Um, over the last few weeks so deserved his shot and then Dan Robson's like actually I've, I've got to play well to get back in the team here and Dobby is a, he's got he's got the drop goal in him I think he started out doing drop goals for fun and trading just messing around and you know you see those players do them all the time from the halfway line you sometimes see forwards giving them a crack um, but what a strike that was he's given it full beans and you know to do that at your old club as well I saw the celebrations when Gloucester had a line out five metres out to try and win the game um, you know for the, for the, for the, the we know how good their driving line out has been. They scored a driving line out try at the weekend as well. And Vive Pafita gets up, steals it, and they boot it out. And the celebrations were pretty well. But yeah, listen, Wasps are, you know, they're trying to get in the top eight. Uh, there's an outside chance, I think, with the way fixtures are going to fall, that if they win all their games, they may still make top four. Uh, hey. Very, 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 hey. very slim chance. Yeah, I know. Very, very slim chance. But because a lot of the teams above them all play each other, um, if they can win all their games, and they've got a lot of boys back fit now, so a dog boo's fit, uh, Launchbury's fit, Malachi Fekatonau's fit, Jimmy Gopper's fit, Jack Barbary's Willis is fit. playing well again. Uh, Barbara's Willis, fit. Yeah. yeah, you start naming, and if they can win all their games, that they could get to, I think it's 70 points. Um, and you just never know, but I think they'll just be focusing on top eight and, um, you know, trying to sneak first and foremost past London Irish, who they've got to go to in a few weeks' time. And Jim, I know you said you didn't pick a few <clears> things <throat> up at London Irish v Quinns, but it was hard to miss Marcus Smith. He was uh, settled right back in and playing well after the Six Nations alongside Danny Keir, wasn't he? In the second half, he was good. Not that he wasn't good in the first half, but London Irish I was really impressed with. And me and Goody had a bit of chat because we love our ruggers about London Irish and the way that they play. And Harlequins, two similar teams. Obviously, with Quinns, you look at their team on paper, it looks like they were better than London Irish in terms of the quality that they've got. But they've been away. Don Brandt came in as captain. Marcus Smith was back at 10. Danny Kerr's on form. Joe Marler was back in the team as well. Uh, Esther Hazen, quality player. Um, I can see. He's ridiculous, isn't he? Oh, he'd be, he would be, like, as in, if I'm a premiership manager, a player like him, 
is your number one choice, as in across any team. I can't mm. think any team in the Prem who wouldn't have him as number one. What he does is just every week, it's not that he just does it every now and again, making game line, scoring tries, physicality, rocking up. I'd have him in every every single day of the week. But also Rona for London Irish, very similar yeah. in terms of what he yeah. does as well. So call it a game. Again, I spoke about it at the start of the show. It was so difficult to commentate on because there was so much. So as a viewer, you would have been loving it. It was breathtaking at times. And there was quick taps, quick throw-ins, line breaks, knock-ons. It was mental. And I'm going to segue slightly. The talking point before the game was Mathieu Reynal, the French referee. No, no, no. The breakdown, the scrums, I know, no. I thought he was fantastic. I really did. And that, that, and the big thing, you're thinking before the game, right, you've got a French referee, issues around the breakdown, how will they manage the scrum? And the breakdown was a bit of a free-for-all. And I think it was important, like Nick Evans came on and said it's important for the growth of the teams or whatever or something like that around having a French referee. But I just thought the game was brilliant. I thought it was a great advert for what rugby should be when it played in the summer. I mean, in dry conditions, on a decent pitch. So I just thought it was brilliant. I thought both teams threw it around. Harlequins were definitely the better team. London Irish could have scored four tries. Yeah. I say could have. It's all well, it's like Goody saying with England, like they could have beat Scotland, they should have beat Scotland, they should have done this, and they would have won the Six Nations. So, on, so mate, I you, know, finished, I know. you finished fourth, mate. What are you on about? Yeah. Mate, you're getting rid of your coach, apparently. So I don't know who for. <laughs> we're settled. Scotland, we're settled. Nothing's been said. It's all quiet on the Western Front, if you can say that, even though Edinburgh's on the East, but Scotland, so I don't want to stereotype East and West. But my point being, around London Irish, that was it for them in terms of their season, trying to make the top four. The fact that they came away with nothing from that game and they blew so many chances. They're still a quality team. They play a fantastic brand of rugby. They've got some great English players. Uh, they've got some great exports as well. A big turning point was for, the, for them was when Nick Phipps went off with the yellow yeah. card. I think Harlequin scored two tries. When Danny Kerr went off, nothing really happened for London Irish. So for an advert for a game of rugby, it lived up to exactly what we thought it would. Your point being, Jim... Harlequins play a fantastic style of rugby. A pleasure to watch and commentate on. <laughs> Did I commentate on it or not? That's what you said on Twitter. Absolute third. Oh, no. How many interactions did I get? I got about 15 followers off the back of it. Andy Rowe wanted me to tag him as well. So why am I going to tag him? Reflex. Deflection. Well, Quinns have arguably... Well, they have been the form team over the last uh, couple of seasons. I mean, they won last year. How do you think their form is going to translate over to European rugby this weekend? Going to win it. Is that a we? Was that a we, Jim? You, you, I couldn't say we. I couldn't say oh, we. I okay. need to see how they perform. I need to see how they go at the weekend against Montpellier away. If they can win that, then we will go all the way. That's the big thing. Because if you're Harlequin, right, and... We know how difficult it is to go back-to-back for premierships, don't we, Andrew? There's only been a few that have done it a couple of times in their career. But -hmm. we know how difficult it is to do that. Do you look at Harlequins, and I'm asking you the question, Andrew, as not a fan of Harlequins and me who've questioned them, have they got enough in Europe? Um, Well, this is the thing with Quins, and you said it many times during lockdown. Who knows? right? Because if there is a team, they're not going to change the way they play, right? Their their DNA, they've, they've openly come out and and shown us what their DNA is, how they play. <clears throat> you know, you look at the coaching team, that's not changed. You know, Tabo Matson's trying to add. The only thing I will say that you could have questioned them on last year was defensively. They always had this thing of, if we concede four, we'll score five, so it doesn't matter. But when you get to Europe, you can't necessarily go that way. Tabo Matson's tried to change their defence. They, they were coming up and out on the edge, weren't they, at the weekend, and were nearly getting caught out. I think that is something to do with how they're going to try and defend in Europe as well, where, you know, if you let a team get momentum through just sitting off and soaking up tackles like Montpellier can, then they're just going to take you apart in terms of the close quarter stuff. So where they're trying to get off the line, they're going to make mistakes. When you fly off the line, like Quinns were at the weekend, defensively, which is something that they've added to their game, I think, over the last sort of month, um, in doing that, you are going to make errors at times. Um but also, it's the risk-reward. So you're going after teams. 
you're going after people man and ball and you will get big shots you will get intercepts you will get this so uh, they're trying to improve their defense no doubt their attacking game is phenomenal um you know when you've got marcus smith you've got players like Caden Murley on the wing who i think is ridiculous um i really do esther hazen in the center he can bring physicality but we know the queen's way the offloading game don brandt coming on short lines getting the ball out the tackle that's the way they play danny Kerr sniping they ain't going to change that what they need to do is, you know, be less porous in defence. And that comes with that line speed that they're trying to work on um, and see how they get on this weekend. But yeah, can they can they go on and win Europe? Possibly. Um, you know, the brand of rugby that they do play, ball in hand, is hard to stop at times, isn't it, for any team? Um, and they've got compo- different components of, you know, they've got a decent set piece as well. Obviously, Joe Marler running the scrum there. Um, but it's how can they handle it? Can they handle a team like Leinster in how they play, which is effectively Ireland? Can they handle a big team like La Rochelle or a Montpellier or someone like that uh, in terms of the, the physicality and the power? Well, they will be OK in attack, but defensively, that's the question mark. And then on the other one, the statement that was made, Danny Kerr. And again, I know there's a little bit of hysteria, Goody, you've spoken about him as well. Austin made a big statement. Second best scrum half in the world behind Anton Dupont. And Eddie Jones ain't giving him a sniff. I don't want to go over old ground. But he's so important, isn't he? Apparently he's had his lithium as well. That's the rumour when I was in the stands with the people. He's had a bit of his lithium he's had, besides. He's had a lot of it done. He's had it. It's not the first time either. How's he hit it? How's he hit that? Because it, Cause it's just, I it's saw just it. the front bit. Sir. It's just the front bit. So you don't need to hide it. You can just go in and get it done and it will just grow back as long as you don't have to shave your head. Shave your head, well, take I your never. boots off, put your boots back on and off you go. Bend over, boots back on, boots on your hands, tie around your neck. Well, let's finish off the premiership then. Uh, Steve Diamond described his side as pathetic, embarrassing and inexcusable in their 45-10 home defeat to Newcastle. What have you guys made of that? Bit harsh from a consultant, is it not? <laughs> Don't think he's going to be a consultant for long, Jim. He's announced it. That's what he is, though. That's yeah. what he is. I did say Special that. Official title is consultant. That's what I saw and I thought, my God, that's a bit harsh. But look, he is harsh. We know that. And the saying goes, without being harsh, I'm going to be harsh. I can't bother third. I said it. You can, like, I, I know you shouldn't be getting your pants pulled down against Newcastle. And everything you're hearing out of Worcester is that, that they, had, they had the same food boards as I had after that final in Europe. So if they've had that, <laughs> they ain't feeling good. But, I mean, he's calling them out. That's what he's doing, isn't he? He's yeah. playing tough love. He is calling them out publicly and... He's trying everything, isn't he? Like, why not? He's he's a consultant, and from what I'm hearing, he's told lads, if you don't want to be here, there's a hooking door. You can get you can get out and get straight on the M5 and go and head down to Cornwall if you want. So, you, I know there's no relegation battle, but have they thrown the? That's the away? point. That's that's the point for me, and I've said it before about Worcester. Um, I'm looking at it, going because there's no relegation. Where's the desire? And I said it about Worcester a few weeks back, didn't I? Where is the desire? Well, here's the th- facts. You, you've taken 45 points at home to Newcastle. Steve Diamond, who is the boss next year, is a consultant now. He's the DOR next year. He's the gaffer. He's trying to bin players off and there's players that have left. You know, he's trying to reshape the squad. There's going to be massive changes at that club in terms of the, the players that are there. And all you're thinking is, how bad is training going to be this week? Because, because there's no relegation... And, you know, there'll be some players on that field that won't play for Worcester next year. So it's like, oh, it doesn't really matter, does it? Um, And that's what came across in Steve Diamond's uh, sort of opinion of the performance and the game and everything like that. So, um, yeah, he's raging. It's going to be a tough place for the next few weeks. And ultimately, when you're looking at it, if Diamond's is the boss, you've got to kind of abide by what he says and... You know, with no relegation, you're not getting much out of that team. And that's why I think relegation is very important or a playoff game or something in there where there's a jeopardy on the line because dead rubbers like that leave them for the URC. Well, let's go back to the Premiership game at the weekend. We can have a chat now with one of the London Irish players from that one. Winger Ollie Hassel Collins joins us. How are you, mate? Yeah, good. Thanks. How are you? Yeah, thanks for having you, mate. It's been a long time coming. We've been trying to get you on. It obviously would have been nice for probably you to come on after a win. Uh, I was at the game, commentated, put it all on social media. Look at me, look at me. Uh, so I saw you doing your thing, which was class. I mean, it wasn't through, if we're going to go straight to the game, it wasn't through a lack of a poor performance, was it? You had the opportunities in that game, uh, just didn't take them. And against a Harlequins team, who, as we know, are a champion team. How was it looked at from your point of view as a team? No, exactly that. Um, I think we're kind of our own worst enemies. Uh, I think the most frustrating thing is that similar situation 
uh, last year. Obviously, we went on this nice run and then we kind of lost five or six on the bounce and kept falling down the table. Um, so we've had these two two past weeks being pretty tough. Uh, we've got four games, three or four games left. So just want to make the most of them and obviously try and keep building up and see what we can get to at the end of the day, really. I will come on to your stuff in a minute, but I'm intrigued to know uh, how some of the coaches were after the game yesterday. One of my favourite ever coaches that I've played under is Brad Davis, who's obviously coaching you boys now. Viva, as we called him. Viva Brad Davis. Yeah. Absolute legend of a bloke. Um, but his toys can go out the pram pretty quickly as well. I absolutely love him as a guy. How was he after the game? Was he raging? Is he? Has his teeth um, come out again? Because his teeth fall out when he gets angry. His, <laughs> yeah, no, his teeth didn't fall out, thankfully. <laughs> That's when you know you're in a bad place and his teeth fall out. Um, <laughs> now nah, he uh, he's probably fuming inside, but he um, kept to the corner, kept on the beers. Uh, didn't, didn't have too much to say, but I'm sure he'll have something to say on Friday when we go back in for training. Yeah, good stuff. Um, let's talk about you then, obviously, having a, a fantastic season. Eight tries and you've made the most clean breaks in the Premiership from any player. So things are going well individually. You've obviously been in and around Eddie's squad as well. Frustrated to not get a, a cap yet from since last June? Or, or, or is it a case of you've been in the squad, you're happy there learning and you know things will come as they as time goes on? Yeah, um, yeah, I loved I loved my time there. I learned obviously a lot of this. They're the best players in England, and so you know you can't go in there and not learn something. Um, even just the training, the professionalism around the place, just stuff I can take back to Irish, um, was massive. Um, I think now it's just just made me hungry, and you know try and go on that summer tour. Um, just yeah, try and try and perform consistently, keep keep building the stats, and then hopefully it's kind of Eddie can't ignore me, and yeah, he'll, he'll take me, and then we'll see what happens from there, really. If in doubt, though, mate, just move up to the second row. That's where you used to play, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, back in the day. I don't know if I'm tall enough yet. Oh, man, I reckon you'd be all right. What's the practice? You're not keen for that? Was it just your height or were you thinking? <laughs> I'll do, I'll do back row. I'll do back row. I don't know about second row. Exactly. Mate, stay out the what? forwards. When it, the size of a horse, mate, stay out the forwards and just run over. That's where the money is. People. Mate, the second rows get paid <laughs> the highest in the team. They're there, the number ones, and rightly bloody so, the most gifted. So, Ollie, you're missing a trick there. Not that the wingers don't get highly paid, but the second rows, they're the ones. I thought it was prop. Uh, yeah, you might be right. Tight head props in the second rows are the one. The poor the tens. hookers. I mean, tens, yeah, tens, tens as well, mate. Poor That's hookers. Cool. Being called a hooker, right? Being called a hooker and then getting the lowest paid in the team. Anyway, we're not here to talk about money. That's not your, why we're here, Ollie, but we segue. <laughs> True. Uh, and so th this week you got a week off, right? Um, yep. There's no game uh, in the Challenge Cup for you guys. Uh, of the squad, it's, it's really hard, actually. I've been involved a few games and a few times when you know you've got a week off and you've lost that last game. What are the, the boys like? Are you going away on holiday? Are you, you know going back into the club to train, even though you've got the week off, is there a bit of a mix of, of emotions? Yeah, a few of the boys have gone away. Um, we've got training uh, Friday and Saturday because we're not sure when the game is yet. It's either a Friday or a Saturday game. So I think they're just preparing for that. Um, but I think I think the week off is probably needed um, just to kind of recharge, reset. Obviously, our last, our last week off was Christmas time and then in the Prem. Um, so I think, yeah, I think it'll do the boys some good to have some time off, have some family time, get in the sun, um, yeah, and just recharge. Any more tats or not? I've seen there's a few tattoos and then I've actually read somewhere here that you've got a Harry Potter tattoo or something on your arm, have you? <laughs> I think I'm going for like the kind of like a random look. I don't really have like a theme going on. Um, but yeah, I've got a golden snitch on my arm. I don't know if you've seen mine, mate. I've got a Superman tattoo that at the age of 24, it looks sick. Now I'm 40 years old, I'm looking at it like, what the hell? So be careful, is what I should say around <laughs> tattoos. Yeah, right. And also, yeah. appar apparently I'm friends with J.K. Rowling or Joe. So maybe, hey, maybe I get her autograph and you can get that signed. Top of the yeah, back or something. That looks sick. Goody, what do you reckon? Would you get that done or not? Mate, I've, uh, I've got literally no tattoos. I've got loads of body space for tattoos, but I haven't got one tattoo on my body. It's just not me, mate. And seeing your Superman tattoo every time I see it, Jim, I'm like, it, it looks like Batman now. It doesn't even look like Superman. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> right. uh, yeah. Well, talking uh, about movies and stuff, I know you, you mentioned the snitch there um, in terms of a, a tattoo. I'm hearing your nickname at the club is The Grinch. Um, <laughs> do you want to tell us about that? 
Um, there's not much to say really. Kind of, so I did the ACE program, um, coming up through that, and then so the year the boys above me, um, just gave it because apparently I looked like him. Um, and then it's kind of they got signed, and then I got signed, and then they kind of carried on through the first team. Um, but there's not much to it apart from that I look like him, apparently. Who, who branded you that? Uh, it's Jack Cook, Jacob Atkins, um, those guys. And you, mate, you're flying way ahead of them now. So who, who are the mugs now? Eh? <laughs> yeah, I like it. Is there? There's obviously you know a good young vibe there. The likes of yeah, we mentioned them before Arundel, obviously Tom Parton, and Dolly Parton, as Jim calls them at the back. Yourself, yeah. the back three players there in the backs. There's a lot of youngsters coming through. Um, it's it must be really inspiring to, to to play together, but also, you know, I know Wysaki Naholo was there for a bit and he didn't really play too much. Did you learn much off him, or was it a case of he wasn't really there too much to learn off? Yeah. <laughs> no, I did. He was always, even though he wasn't kind of playing, he was kind of on the touchline, um, just giving me little instructions here and there when he could, just in drills and in the fifteen on fifteen kind of stuff, um, and even just dropping him a message. He was he was so easy to talk to. Just kind of asking him if he could go over the game from the weekend or I know what what do you think of this clip? It's just um yeah, he's there. It's like a nice, nice tool to have, um, really just to go to. Same as when I was there with Topsy. Um, obviously a legend of London Irish and, and rugby, really. Um, so he was nice to have as well. Similar, similar thing. Kind of being able to go to him and being, oh, what do you think of this? What what could I have done? Um so yeah, it's, I learned so much of both of them. And what about you young lads as well then, Ollie? in terms of looking at players, and there's a lot of them, I can say this, you might be a bit young, but I'm sure you probably do know the past of London Irish. Unbelievable academy, loads of young players coming through, but then they tend to go to the likes of Quinns or Saracens and, and these teams. Is that spoken about? And I suppose now it's a two-pronged question because you're now building a team that really, on its day and on paper, could potentially be in the top four for the next few years going forward. Yeah, like we said earlier, kind of the goal is to all be able to play together in the same team, like having a whole 15 of, I think Northampton chucked one out, didn't they, earlier, a whole Academy 15 or English 15. Um, so that, I think that would be that would be quality for, for us and for the club. Um, and yeah, like I said, we've obviously had those past players have kind of come, come through and then gone. But I think, yeah, we're building nicely and we've all... I think the coaches are keeping us all happy, so we're we're enjoying learning, playing together, um, and yeah, the vibe the vibe's great at the at the club. All right, Ollie. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show, mate. Really appreciate it, and uh, best of luck when the season gets back underway for you. Cheers. Thank you. Top man. Man. Yeah, yeah, uh, mate. I've commentated. You'd, you'd have seen it at the weekend. He is massive for a winger. Six foot four. The legs on him, the quads on him. When I saw him, I was. I was kind of taken aback at how big he was as a physical specimen. Um, I remember you mentioned he, it two years ago. I remember you yeah. talking about it two years ago. And I was thinking, double-barreled name, hell of a lid, blonde there. Really? And then, yeah. And then I saw him. I was like, yeah, really? You can see why he, made, he, he makes more line breaks than anyone else in the Prem. They're good, mate. The London Irish lads are good. And obviously, <laughs> me and you nearly signed there. And in hindsight, it was the right decision that I didn't go there. But... <laughs> What they're building there, and I mentioned it to him, and I didn't speak about it when we were chatting about the game. There seems like a really nice energy there. Some real good young lads coming through. Was Thocken the single was there, wasn't he, back in the day as well? And Anthony Watson and these lads, they've had yeah. good back threes coming through the academy, and they just let them go. So I suppose with my neutral hat on, I hope that they do get an opportunity to build, but it's all going to come down to success, isn't it? It's all one yeah. a good playing a great brand of rugby, but... Seeing young lads like that come through, um, I mean, where else is there for them to go if they're playing well and scoring tries and, you know, making it into the kind of top four, top eight, as it is this season to Europe? Well, let's talk about the URC then. Jim, the South African teams are on a roll. Yes, they bloody are. Apart from the Sharks who got beat by Edinburgh the week before. I don't know if you saw the result from Friday night. It was close. It was close for the Dragons. (laughs) <laughs> why are you always so horrible to the Dragons uh, I'm not it's easy to say that isn't it my goodness me I, uh, Ross Moriarty I'm going to say it I feel for yeah. him massively um, it's going to come out in the next few days what he's done but for a man who's that hard to be making the noises that he was on the pitch he's yeah. I'm going to say it, he's fucked himself and I just hope that 
It was more a scream out of anger that he is going to be spending more time on the sidelines as opposed to it being a really, really nasty injury, which my gut tells me that it kind of is. So yeah. I know we're taking oh. the piss. And we, you know, we're taking the piss out of it. And, you know, 51 points against three. A few of the coaches, Dean Ryan, came out and said after the game, like, I, at what point, when you look on paper and you look at the size of the two teams, can you compete? And Ross Moriarty is one of the players that can compete. So I'll say we, we wish him all the best. Like, I know, Goody, you're a big fan of his as well, of the way that he plays. He's a top lad. Yeah. And uh, it didn't look great. Yeah, he's, he's hard as anything. Nice guy. Um, yeah, I've heard it's a pretty bad knee injury. So hopefully he can recover pretty quickly. But this is the thing, and I said it before around uh, the South African teams, the way their season has always been kind of worked out, it's all based around uh, the rugby championship, the spring box, and when they play in Super Rugby. So we've obviously seen Super Rugby start over in Australia and New Zealand over the last few weeks. These guys are used to playing this time of year, right? So they they go sort of March, April, leading into, you know, we're seeing all these big South African teams now playing a lot of their international stars because they're building up to the June internationals, aren't they? Um, and that's where you're seeing, you know, where we've seen the South Africans not perform earlier in the season in the likes of October, November time when perhaps all, none of the internationals are playing because they're playing the rugby championship and then they're on the November tour. Um, now you're seeing the value of the true strength of these African teams. And, you know, I think all four of them won this weekend, didn't they? So, you know, you put 51 points on the Dragons. Okay, it's only the Dragons, but they, they just looked a different cat of fish, didn't they, completely? It, any of the other games stand out for you? Links a big win over Munster. Yeah. Munster was good. Uh, that's the thing. As in, is it a surprise? Not really. Munster, they're desperate to obviously beat Leinster. Obviously. And it's all going to probably come down to then at the end of the season. Like, you could potentially see that. It could be an Ulster. It could be an Edinburgh in that top four. But it's going to be Leinster, right? So, the big question around the URC is who can beat Leinster? Well, Ulster. Ulster, yeah. <laughs> That's it. Just. So, again, this is one of the conversations. But I'm telling you now, a Stormers or a Bulls could beat mm-hmm. Leinster, I reckon, on yeah. the day. Because yeah. apparently, and it's not been formalised yet, but what I'm hearing, because there's a lot of who knows, is that the final is going to be in South Africa. So, really? Yeah, so having a final in South Africa will be class, I think, as a commentator. Um, but that's where you're thinking, can Leinster win it again? Well, really, when you look at the results, but the fact that South African teams are coming good now, the fact that they've been comfortable, will be at the Sharks against Edinburgh again, and the conditions, with it being better... June and July in South Africa than probably what it will be in our summer. Will it or not? I don't know. The climate is yeah. the Southern Hemisphere. It's the winter. It's yeah. the winter. But it will yeah, be. If it, mate, if you, wherever you're playing, whether it's Joburg, whether it's Cape Town, whether it's Durban, it's way better weather than it is here anyway. So, Yeah. But the big thing around it at the weekend is, was the officiating. I don't know if you saw Stevie Ferris. He was going off on one. Raging. The Ulster Raging. Balls game. Rightly so. Mate, rightly so. Him and the great Bobby Skinstad were talking about it. Two yellow cards in that game, uh, the Bulls versus Ulster. Yeah, Treadwell puts a high tackle, stands his ground, shoulder on the Bulls 15. And the slow-mo comes in. What annoyed me, right? I, I'm going to segue again slightly. What annoyed me was, in this game, the TMO kept piping in. He kept piping in the whole time, saying, oh, you need to go and look at this. We think this, we think that. Oh, there's no clear evidence. It was just an absolute shit show. Yeah, for me, it wasn't a yellow card, but it was a yellow card. But in context of the game, where the ball's back row cut Sia, puts an unbelievably physical shot in, similar, high tackle, but with force and gets a yellow card. I'm like, I just can't work it out. And this is why even us as commentators, I commentate, lads, commentators, <laughs> pundits, fans, imagine. coaches... It's like no one can work it out. It's just mental at the minute. And I know Dan McFarlane mentioned the, the referee in the week before when it was a try, no try, should have been a try. They should have got the try. They didn't get the try. Then the referees came out and said it should have been a try. And now we've got a yellow card. Was it a yellow card? Who knows? The yellow card could see us with a yellow card. Should have been a red card. And no wonder we're all in this minefield of not understanding what's what. So 
we talked up the Premiership referees, talked up Matthew Raynal in that game. There just needs to be a step up. I know JP Doyle is now Scottish and he's going to be helping out the referees in the URC. This is the growth of the game. It needs to be aligned. And I get you're in South Africa. I get that you're not going to get the rub of the green. It was the same for Edinburgh versus the Lions. Some of the decisions around the breakdown as well. Like, lads, literally, they're not even on their hands. They're on their heads, turning ball over. Like, they're on their heads. <laughs> the feet are in the air and they're getting away with the ball. And you're looking at it, it's like, one, trying to commentate on it, but then trying to justify it. It's, oh, you're in South Africa, so you're not going to get the rub of the green. Like, if we're talking about the growth of the game and all these things, then that can't be it. We can't be saying, oh, you're in South Africa. Lovely spot, by the way. A couple of weeks on a micro tour, if you're not playing, it's probably a dream scenario as well because you get to go out. I don't know if you can go out because can you go out? I can't go out, COVID, different places. But it needs to change is what I'm saying. I don't want to be talking about the referee, but that was a headline point out of that balls also the game. It won't change, not with South Africa. It's always been the same way. Always been the oh, same way. Oh, here he goes. There South he is. Africa. Since the dawn there of time. Is. You the were Kiwis about it. it for years. You know, in Kiwis South Africa... There. There's a lot of South African fans who don't support South Africa. I don't want to get political. They actually support the All Blacks. Yes. That's, 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 that's all he said. They, they that's glory that's supporters. There's nothing wrong with that. Speaking about South Africans, there's a few rumours floating around with a few of their players moving. There are. Andy Rowe, there are. The biggest of the big and the smallest of the small. Uh, Luke Diago, the biggest of the big. Massive second row. Uh, and the smallest of the small fat clerk, the other end of the height spectrum, uh, both off to Japan from South Sharks, from what you hear. They're both leaving. I'll be sad to see fat clerk head out to Japan. Um, not because I don't want him to earn as many yen as possible, because he deserves to, but he's been brilliant in the Premiership, hasn't he? It's where he came over to the Premiership at Sale. don't think he was anywhere near the South African setup. And then he's obviously exploded in terms of form at sale. His hair's gone everywhere. His hair's got blonder. He's got better and better. And he was one of the the best players. He came on the podcast, yeah. I I got him down at Twickenham as well, interviewed him down there. Pre-match. Lovely guy. Um, But, yeah, I've heard he's off to Japan to pick up a lorry load of yen, and rightly so. With no disrespect to the Japanese league, and I've only watched a little bit of it, but speaking to the lads, they ain't going for the ruggers, are they? (laughs) They go for the yen. (laughs) I think the yen's a big factor. Exactly. I'd, I'd love our currency to be called yen. How shit does the pound sound? You call it the yen. Um, it's anyway. what's, worse, what's worse, Jim, is the Scottish pound. You can't use those more. notes anywhere. The Scottish pound, you can't use it anywhere. Well, you can't, Andrew, if you've got the green ones, the hundred pound notes that you knock about with. No. <laughs> anyway, chatting to the great Bobby Skinstad, he said there's an interesting model in South Africa at the minute around... Razi Erasmus, well, it's kind of out there in the public domain, it's not really a rumour, around the encouragement of players in their prime to go and earn in Europe. And we've seen that, haven't we? You just mentioned two of the players there. Um, Etzebeth is another one. Uh, Bermudan's obviously another one. I know he's not in his prime. But they're encouraged. Players are now encouraged to go and cash in in the Premiership, but more so in France, where the big money is. And then what they do is that they have the opportunity then to bring these young lads in. And this probably begs the question, doesn't it, around the growth of the game in South Africa. Maybe they've got the right model. Everyone keeps talking about Ireland in terms of how they do things with the schools and the colleges, but South Africa clearly have got something right. And we saw Hendricks are playing for the Lions against Edinburgh at the weekend, gets an opportunity because the starting tens are playing over in Europe. And then what they do is then bring them back when they're absolutely backed at the age of 36, 37. Like, as in not even on the age of 32, 33. They're bringing them back, like Scout Brits, um, what would you say, uh, Bismarck do for C. These players bring them back when they are absolutely bollocks, but they still do a job. So maybe they've got it right, but it's an interesting model is what I'm trying to say. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Goody. Thanks, Tristan. And thank you very much for listening. Don't forget to check us out on YouTube and make sure you've subscribed on Spotify. Rugby spot. Spotify, pod, 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 pod.